Hi, I'm Marsha Regenstein from George Washington University, and uh, I work with something called the uh, National Center for Medical Legal Partnership. So we are a, a group of people who work with hundreds of organizations around the country to try to advance the notion of bringing lawyers and civil lawyers to the bedside, essentially, to help with patients get access to the benefits and the services that they're really entitled to, but kind of can't figure that out on their own. And the healthcare organization and the people who staff the healthcare organization are not necessarily trained and equipped to do that. So this is an idea that started about uh, in the early 80s in Boston, uh, led by Dr. Barry Zuckerman, and it was not that different really from the early origins of the community health center movement where Jack Geiger and others wanted to write a prescription to get to a lawyer or write a prescription to go to the grocery store and buy food. So this sense that the person was not just existing within a clinical context. So from that early origin, it's grown to more than three or 400 organizations. The key element is a civil legal aid civil legal attorney who partners with a healthcare organization, usually a community health center or a hospital or some part of a hospital system. There's some mechanism that's uh, developed to identify patients in need, and the lawyer springs into action and provides those services for the patient. It could be a really quick consult, literally a five-minute telephone call that will unlock some benefit for the patient. It could be a long case. So it's highly variable, and because it's highly variable, it suffers from all those problems that social determinants of health interventions that are highly variable suffer from in terms of evaluation. So right, oh, the bigger button, sorry. So what I've done here, just to give you a flavor of medical legal partnership, is to show you three examples. This is from a health affairs article that came out a couple years ago that described some of the you know, the, uh, the construct of medical legal partnership. And so here I'm showing three examples. One is what I call the bread and butter MLP. It's a large medical legal partnership that exists within a children's hospital, in this case Cincinnati, which is a terrific, terrific place uh, to embed social determinants of health in work. This is one of many, many initiatives that Cincinnati Children's does. They have referred about 800 and so patients in a one-year period to lawyers. Um, they have several clinics where they bring medical legal partnerships, and their three main legal issues are housing, public benefits, and education. And they will provide these services to anyone in need, regardless of the clinical circumstance. Then you have another MLP type model, which really targets specific clinical issues or life stage issues. In this case, uh, the Delaware D uh, Department of Public Health has a couple of medical legal partnerships. This one uh, is focusing on postpartum depression, where there's a public health program targeting postpartum depression, and they've added lawyers to do home visits and interventions to help patients, and they've seen some pretty astounding uh, outcomes because of that. And then the third is Whitman Walker here in DC, which has embedded an integrated medical legal partnership throughout their activities. They don't think of it as a legal intervention, they think of it as providing care, and they have 11 full-time lawyers on their staff. I'm gonna try to run through this. HRSA has deemed enabling services as including legal services. So this is one way that legal services come to the bedside, and there's other uh, organizations that are now taking interest in this. Lots of different um, opportunities now with value-based interventions that are more open to crafting solutions that are not necessarily uh, traditionally reimbursable services. But there is a dilemma, the catch-22. People say to me, where should I put my MLP? Who needs it most? Uh, and then funders will say, what works? And then we will say, we need money to tell you what works and where to put it. So it's that, uh, and all of these interventions are having these, uh, these challenges to figure out what is the evidence base the field is very reactive now, lots of need, and people who become involved in MFP on the healthcare side 
are not interested in filling out forms and tracking time. They want to help patients. Lawyers are not used to doing this at all. So it's a culture shift to, to, to get the data on value. Thanks.